Hello everyone, my name is Denise Cameron and I'm a graduate student at Emporia State University working with Dr. William Jensen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my presentation and for your interest in our research. We're assessing spatial and temporal patterns and abundances of migrating and wintering birds on the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve. I'd like to start by acknowledging the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy for funding this project. Special thanks to Jane Coger of Homestead Ranch for letting us use her property. And of course to Emporia State University and Dr. Jensen for all his help and guidance. So to begin, I'll give you an idea of what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to give you some background and talk about why this research is important. Talk about some of the previous research and what might be lacking. Go over our specific questions we're asking and how we aim to answer them give you an idea of the methods we're using. I'll go over the temporal patterns of some species of interest from the first year of data collection, and then summarize and tell you where we plan to take this research in the future. So I'll start with the decline in avian species across North America. As you can see in this figure, uh, there's a lot of groups that are seeing a decline, but on the bottom there, you, it shows that grassland species are really seeing that steepest decline. And a lot of that can be attributed to loss of habitat. Here we have the Tallgrass Prairie ecoregion. The map on the right shows the original extent of the Tallgrass Prairie versus the 4% remaining. Uh, that bit you see, the dark green in eastern Kansas, that's the Flint Hills. And due to the rocky soil, it made it impractical for cultivation. And this area was mostly used for rangelands, uh, which did help maintain so the integrity of the habitat, however, annual burning and extensive gra grazing has made it less, less varied than it has been historically. So this region is important for bird conservation. It was named a bird conservation region by the NABCI and is also an important migration corridor. As you can see from the map on the left, Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve is located right in the heart of the Flint Hills. So both the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve and Homestead Ranch utilize patch burn grazing. And what patch burn grazing does is instead of burning the entire pasture each year, portions of the pasture are burned. And what this does is it makes a more varied landscape in both the height and the thickness of the grasses. This influences the distribution of grazers as they prefer those that fresh growth. And it also just creates a more diverse habitat, habitat for different grassland species. So we know a lot about um, breeding season habitat use in grasslands. And really where we're lacking is knowing what species are using these habitats during migration and during winter. Some of the research we do know about has to do with winter habitat use by the authors listed here as well as some in spring migration. Robert Penner did extensive work on spring shorebird surveys throughout the Flint Hills. But we still need to know more about what species are using this habitat during winter and migration, as well as what specific portions of the habitat are they utilizing. So to get into our specific question, what we wanna know is if this patch burn grazing management is influencing the mosaic of avian habitat use throughout the Flint Hills. We're gonna do that by looking at the occurrence and abundance of these migrating wintering birds, focusing on seasonal and spatial patterns, as well as emphasis on some grassland dependent target species pointed out by the US Fish and Wildlife and the Park Service. Also, I'll be doing greater prairie chicken let counts, community service science events, and develop some repeatable protocol that Tallgrass Prairie can use moving forward. Here's our study area in the lower right. You see the map of Kansas with Chase County highlighted. The middle map shows the distribution of Tallgrass Prairie versus Homestead Ranch there in the south. Then the zoomed in maps show the pasture boundaries and burn unit boundaries along with our point count circles in red. So these circles were placed throughout the landscape according to those different burn and pasture boundaries. They're placed so that they abut an existing trail and so that the middle of the circle is along a ridge top. Now these were placed in an effort to avoid 
woods, any ponds or riparian areas, and any existing roads or trails. So at these point count circles, I'm utilizing two different survey methods. The first is a transect flush count and hopes will flush individuals that wouldn't otherwise be seen during a point count. And then that's followed up by a nine minute point count split into three minute sections. And so we're doing that in hopes to have a time removal way of estimating uh, detection probability. So I'm keeping track of detection types, uh, doing distance, collecting distance data for all detections, and also keeping track of any ancillary sightings throughout my time at both study sites, or I'm sorry, at Tallgrass Prairie, just to document any species of interest or any rare species that I'm seeing on the preserve. I will say there's a lot of difficulties with surveying in migration in winter. These birds are often not singing, they don't have established territories, and they're moving around quite a bit. So there's a lot of assumptions we're hoping to, um, to meet, which is why we're utilizing multiple survey methods. So to give you an idea of the span of the project and when we're doing these surveys, I started data collection in fall of 2020, and I'll go through spring of 2022. Here's our three survey seasons and the dates associated. I'm doing two week survey rounds, which what that means is throughout these survey seasons, every two weeks, I will survey every single point at both survey, at both study sites. Our community counts are done during peak migration and also to coincide with the Christmas bird count in the winter. I'm doing mid-season -veg mid vegetation surveys to determine any visual obstruction patterns. And then in the spring, I'm doing greater prairie chicken lep counts. So here's a table showing those species of interest that I mentioned. I'll point out that for the buff-breasted sandpiper and the gra greater prairie chicken, they're listed as near threatened. And then the Sprague's pipit is vulnerable on the global scale. Additionally, the short-eared owl is identified as a species in need of conservation in the state of Kansas. So now I'll get into some of the seasonal patterns and abundance we're finding, starting with American golden plover. I do want to start out or point out that there on the x-axis, that one, two, three, four, that denotes those two-week survey rounds. And then I've got the date spans of each season also listed. So in the case of the golden plover, they were seen only in spring, and it was during one survey round that flocks were found in a very recently burned pasture. For the upland sandpiper, they were also seen in spring with the numbers uh, getting higher towards the end of spring, which makes sense because they're coming into their breeding grounds here in the Flint Hills. So for the long spurs, the Smith long spur is our species of interest. Um, most of our detections were via their rattle flight call, which can be very hard to differentiate from the um, Lackland long spur, long spur, which is why these were put in as species. And so you can see throughout fall and spring migration, we've got some larger flocks moving through as well as some individuals. And then in winter, a few overwintering individuals were also detected. The greater prairie chicken was seen throughout all three survey seasons with more seen in the spring. Uh, we'll point out that line across seven individuals for ancillary counts um, throughout one, three, and four survey rounds. Um, those were seven individuals that were on a lek that I would pass by each day when I would survey out there. And it was just interesting to see them uh, lekking straight through to the end of our spring season. Detections of the short-eared owl were sparse. Uh, we did get to one for each migration period. Uh, they were detected via a flush and both birds were less than 50 meters away from me when they flushed from the landscape, which tells me that we may have to get pretty close to these guys in order to detect them. The Swainson hawk was also found in the spring. We'll point out that while the transect and the point count different uh, detections during the different surveys are listed on here. That, as I said, I'm keeping track of how all these individuals were detected. And for the most part, these were flyovers, not that they were flushed from the landscape, which is the same also for the Northern Harrier. 
So it's one of our probably most abundant of our species of interest. They're seen during all three rounds. And those ancillary numbers are the highest, which makes sense because I spent a majority of my time traveling around and that's when a lot of these individuals were seen. So for the buff-breasted sandpiper and the Sprague's pipit, I did not detect them during my surveys or during my time at either study site. However, for the Sprague's pipit, they were found by our community science volunteers in both fall and spring migration. So to summarize, we're gonna continue to look at these expected patterns of, of occurrence are these birds moving through when we expect them to? So far the, for, for the first year, that was the case. And it'll be interesting to see if that holds true for this year as well. We wanna know how efficient these survey methods are. Uh, it could be really important to know whether a transect flush count or a point count is a better way to detect a different species. This can be information that's really important for the preserve moving forward. Lastly, we're gonna look closer at some spatial patterns of relative abundance and density, specifically between the different burn pastures and the years since fire uh, to see if we can find any patterns there. Uh, I've got in the lower left-hand corner a picture of a, a phrygianus hawk that essentially overwintered in the Tallgrass Prairie parking lot. So it was a bit of a treat to see that individual on a somewhat daily basis. So I'll end there with a picture of my favorite prairie tree uh, throughout the seasons, as well as some of my favorite work friends, as I call them. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my presentation. Please leave any questions in the comments below, or you can email me directly. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.